Hi, everybody, and uh, good uh, morning still, I guess. Um, this is Danny Cherrod here from Rye, New York, and I welcome everybody uh, to our program uh, today, and I have very distinguished guests uh, today from our Cognition Fund that works uh, with the Waterloo uh, University. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so um, uh, I will start uh, by saying um, good morning, uh, everybody. And I will read um, just a little bit about the uh, background of our, um, our guests today, which is very, very impressive as, as you all will be uh, seeing uh, uh, shortly. So I'll start with Paul. <clears throat> Paul is the CEO and managing partner of Cognition Fund and FTV. Prior to joining uh, FTV, Paul was CEO and founder of Big Brook Asset Management, where he developed machine learning investment strategies to uh, augment fundamental stock analysis. Since inception in 2017 uh, to July 2020, Big Brook uh, outperformed the S&P uh, 500 by 50%. Before that, Paul spent 10 years as senior analyst at QVT Financial, where he was responsible for the firm's global technology and renewable energy portfolios. The portfolio uh, outperformed the benchmark semiconductor index by 450% over the seven years where uh, performance was measured. He has worked in several roles, uh, commercializing technology spun out of research of uh, Calitech. He founded uh, uh, Ganrose, I hope I pronounced it correctly, which was acquired by International um, uh, Rectifier to develop gallium nitrate uh, technology for high-speed power electronics. Partly due to the success um, of the gallium nitrate program, International uh, Re Rectifier was acquired by Infineon. He was also one of the first employees at uh, Exponent uh, for uh, Photonics, where he pioneered semiconductor manufacturing techniques. Um, uh, and really, it's just a, a very short part of the bios uh, because it is very impressive with all of our guests here, um, but that will give you an idea. Uh, Randall Howard, partner and CEO um, uh, at Veridox and Middlebrook Corp, uh, a senior technology executive committed to building world-leading high-growth technology companies. He was honored by the National Angel Capital Organization of Canada and presented with the uh, BDC Capital Canadian Angel of the Year Award in 2014 for his work with the Golden Triangle Angel Network. To jumpstart the Waterloo Investment, Randall helped launch Golden Triangle, which has invested many tens of millions of dollars in fledging tech firms in the Waterloo region. Randall is also a past founding director of um, uh, Communitech. Today, he's a partner at Veradox and CEO of Middlebrook Corp, uh, firms based uh, in uh, Kitchener, Ontario, uh, that provide investment and other services to growing technology companies. Randall graduated from the University of Waterloo with an honors uh, uh, degree in computer science and mathematics. So hi, um, Randall and Mark uh, uh, Payson, uh, president of Valley Idea Labs. Mark is a pioneer in wireless technology and inventor on more than 100 fundamental patents in wireless communication, networking, and computing. As a recognized thought leader with uh, over 35 years in the ICT industry, um, he is the author and editor of numerous articles, papers, and books, and has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Bloomberg, Cybersecurity Magazine, and other publications. He served on over 20 advisory and governance boards for public and private companies over the years, and served as chairman and founding member of the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, Technical Committee Cyber Working Group for Quantum Safe uh, Photography. Um, uh, in uh, Sofia uh, Antipolis, France. Uh, he's a retired uh, senior executive uh, at BlackBerry, where he uh, founded the Advanced Technology Research Center. Previously with Motorola, he was awarded the title of Distinguished Innovator and Science Advisory Board Member for his role in developing technology. So this has been the bios with uh, the highest number of words I cannot pronounce, which means this is uh, very impressive. Thank you. So um, good morning and uh, how are you doing uh, these days? How, is, um, how, we, how are things in, in, in Canada, in your region? I, uh, I, uh, from the COVID point of view, I understand that things still linger, unfortunately. 
I uh, would love to hear your comments. Randall? Yeah, well, Denny, um, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we were a little slower off the mark than the U.S. and Israel on vaccination front, uh, but we're now catched up. I think today we just overtook the U.S. at least on a first dose basis. But the sad fact is we're in a stay-at-home lockdown order to get the cases down, largely because of the variants of concern. And we're hoping to start some reopening in the coming month and so on and get this behind us as we as we get caught up with vaccination. But I mean, the other side of COVID is a year ago, nobody knew what was going on. Everybody thought the sky was falling, etc. This year, everyone is so surgically focused on what's the post-COVID world and what what's the world look like. And as investors, we're all looking at, you know, the post-COVID world, we need new ideas, we need to look at private companies and the next big thing, and that's why we're so excited about Cognition. And uh, on, on my end, you know, I'm, I'm based in New York and got trapped there from border closures, but, <clears throat> you know, it obviously delayed the Cognition project, but it, uh, you know, it gave us time to, to look at our pipeline do some uh, do some modeling and rebranding, and uh, and get ready for when this is over. So here we are. Somehow I missed that fact that you are here in New York. I would have invited you to the conference we held last week at the World <laughs> Trade Center, which was amazing. Uh, uh, Mark, how are things on your end? And where are oh, you? I'm I'm in Waterloo, uh, like Randall. And uh, yes, this uh, I'm. I have over, over the years, I've traveled a lot. And so this is the problem for uh, the past year, but uh, what we're, we're making do, we're actually doing kind of better than I thought after a year of uh, uh, confinement. And maybe I will ask uh, in general, I mean, we will soon talk about what you guys do uh, with the Waterloo University and the research coming out of there. Um, but generally speaking, how would you see the impact uh, so far of COVID on valuations, on the opportunities, on the sectors you guys are investing in. I assume it has different effects on different sectors, and, but in general, how does that affect your, your space? Well, if I could start out again, uh, I mean, counterintuitively, look at the stock markets. They've never been higher. That wasn't true when COVID first struck. So valuations are incredibly high. But uh, the good news for us is that, generally speaking, there's great value in Canada. So some of the best tech, but uh, typically much better pricing on valuations for early stage tech than you would get, say, in the Silicon Valley or some of the other polls. So that's a little bit of an arbitrage that we see as very positive. And those high public market valuations just keep the interest levels high. Um, uh, and I, um, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that um, uh, you see different valuation, uh, different impact in different areas, right? I mean, if it's healthcare, I would guess it's doing better and maybe other segments are... Um, uh, in terms of like, our deal pipeline got better for healthcare type and ag tech type <laughs> investments. Um, because we're so early, I don't think it impacted valuations too, too tremendously. I think it, it mostly gave us a, a much larger pipeline to work, work from. Thank you. So uh, maybe we'll start with uh, the questions that um, uh, I have here for you and, and dive into our conversation. Maybe we'll start with where is Waterloo um, and uh, what makes it so special? And by the way, yeah, we are absolutely aware of the innovation coming from Canada. I believe when we did, when we started to work on our Montreal conference, I think the first name that came to mind is Joshua the famous, um, I forgot his last name, the famous AI, uh, one, of, one of the most famous, if not the most famous AI uh, 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 researchers, right? Uh, so, and I know a lot of what's coming uh, from, from Canada. It, it is very impressive. Yeah. So where is Waterloo and what makes it special? Waterloo is about an hour west of Toronto. It has, the most innovative university in Canada. And its specialties are engineering, art, computer science, and mathematics. I think it's been, it's a relatively young university, so it hasn't had, the, hasn't had time to climb up the cachet curve like Harvard or MIT, but um, it's certainly 
um, certainly you know, a world-class research institute. And uh, when you say not old, how old is it? It's only, go ahead, Mark. No, it was founded in 1957, I think. I understand. Great. And um, um, given the fact, you know, there are universities that's been there before, uh, how did it become the second highest um, uh, density of startups in, in the area without attracting a lot of attention? Well, I mean, perhaps uh, that's a Canadian thing to be a bit understated, uh, Denny, I'm not sure. But um, certainly one way of looking at, at Waterloo is because you've got this top tech university in Canada that was the source not just of research, but tech talent across Canada and even in the U.S. people hire, uh, hire from there it was inevitable that a cluster of tech would form around it. And what's interesting about the location of Waterloo, it's kind of like Waterloo is the San Jose to Toronto, which is uh, San Francisco in the sense that they're about an hour apart. And so that co corridor of being around ca uh, Canada's largest economic center, coupled with the center of great tech, made it inevitable. And in fact, in my career, I started out uh, with my first startup in Canada, in, in the U.S., before startups existed uh, in Chicago, and came back just at a time in the 80s when startups were starting and actually was kind of pioneering of uh, building some of the great tech companies. So each wave has gotten bigger, but it's been built upon the talent, uh, the deep tech and research coming out of out of. Uh, out of the University of Waterloo and on sort of the entrepreneurial spirit. But you're right, uh, it's just not as well known. And partly also because all of those companies are, are like 98% export. So they don't really wave the Canadian flag when they're out there taking on the world. And maybe uh, Paul, I asked you that yesterday, just so uh, before we dive into my next question of what inspired you to do, uh, to do this, um, just so we understand what to place you, right? Uh, the phenomenon of universities that have research centers has been there for many, many years. Uh, I would like to ask two questions. One, what's the difference between your model of having a fund and all the commercializing entities that those universities have, right? I mean, they have, most of them would have a, 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 a segment that's in charge mm -hmm. of taking the research and make it into something that makes money. What's the difference in, in, in the model why some do what you do and others don't and just stay with, uh, with, us, with just that internal office. And my second question would be maybe globally, what's this, the, the most similar uh, uh, university that you can ch show as an example, maybe in the US that does what you do with Waterloo? And I'll add a third question maybe, is it the first university in Waterloo, that, uh, in, Waterloo in, in Canada that actually does that as well or? Yes, this is, this is unique to Canada. It's the first time it's going to be tried there. Um, and the most similar analog that we can find is the Engine Fund at MIT, which is part of the inspiration for, for, this, uh, for this fund. Uh, in terms of commercialization, I think a lot of the commercialization offices uh, like to license technology rather than uh, create companies around it. And our, our idea is to go in and be very active on uh, either ideation or company creation from that IP, as opposed to letting it sit and try to license it. Um, so many universities are missing a major part of what they could have made if they would have built a company rather than just sell the, 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 the licensing. I think so. License, I mean, and particularly these days when licensing valuation has fallen. I mean, Mark can talk about it a little bit when I'm done, but uh, the value of a license has has gone quite down, down quite a bit after the change in legislation in the United States. So, um, so when that so our, th our thesis, our, MIT for it, instance, how how old are they there with this? Uh, the Engine Fund is a couple of years old. So, so this is a, a relatively new phenomenon in in, in the it, it in is the academia world. Mm -hmm. It's relatively new, although there are there are certain clusters around the world that have tried to commercialize technology. Um, so, I, I don't know of anyone who, who's going to do it as aggressively as we are and try to create companies and intercept ideas very early on in the life cycle. Um, and one advantage that Waterloo has is that um, 
the inventors at Waterloo own their own IP. So when we collaborate with them directly, um, there's no, um, the university isn't involved in trying to direct how it gets used. Now, most of your careers, all of you is in the private segment with, uh, you know, different tech companies at different stages. What inspired you to uh, now go to the academia and start uh, this fund? Well, Danny, each of us might have a different answer to that question. I was involved very early in my career is I built public companies. And for the last 20 years, I've been an early stage investor. So I've been on the front lines of the trenches of uh, getting companies financed at the very early stages where there's best returns, but it's also a lot more operational and strategic heavy lifting involved. Uh, what, I, what I observed is in Canada, we actually have less capital before the venture capital series A than other countries. And so it's a huge opportunity when you bring funds to get some amazing, as you talked about already, valuations of some great companies that are going to be world beating. But once you start to look at commercializing uh, research that's deeper science and tech coming out of universities, that takes even more special skills. So when this idea came by, I was all in. And you know, then uh, Mark was brought into the team and Paul was brought into the team each to uh, to bring the magic to bring this to life because it's a very special opportunity but it's also and it's one that's needed but it takes very special people to bring it off and i think you'll see um we we didn't hear the uh the last words i think you were you're on mute Randall. sorry well no i just said it's a very special opportunity but a very special team and i think probably both Mark and uh, Paul could comment on your question and give their perspective as well. Mark, you want to take it? Oh, well, sure. Um, I've, um, I've been involved in, in what we in the industry, in the wireless industry, uh, refer to as advanced technology, which, is, uh, which kind of means three to 13 years in the future. Uh, and these were all these is these technologies are, are what I think Paul was referring to as deep tech, and these are where the good returns are. Uh, it's not much return you can get uh, large returns in in three years or less because those uh, those supply chains are already budgeted for, they're already allocated, and and so on. And um, I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity to do something very good in in Canada. And there's a lot of deal flow. It's not. It's not like um, uh, like UW has got well, well more deal flow than we actually can absorb. So that's that's actually a good sign. Paul, anything you'd like to add? My my answer. You know, my passion is technology development. Um, you know, I spent some time in the public markets and spent some time, you know, doing other things and. Um, I'm getting back to what I enjoyed doing the most, and that's making technology work and putting it into real products. Now, I have a question here that actually leads me to my next question anyway. Someone is asking here, how do you compare with Quantum Valley Investments? Oh, it's, it's completely different. Um, I'm actually uh, working with Quantum Valley Investments, and uh, their focus is, of course, on strictly quantum technology, uh, which a lot of it is very far off into the future. Um, quantum sensors, quantum computing, um, uh, and um, whereas this, uh, whereas the fund is really is a general technology fund, so we would not uh, okay. compete with Quantum Valley Investments. We're going to be multi-sector, so we're going yeah. to be investing in clean tech, um, computer software, um, you know, advanced engineering, advanced manufacturing. So we're not going to uh, we're not exclusively focused on quantum technologies uh, like like quantum value investments. Thank you, and I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, we will have time for questions uh, along the uh, this hour. But also, we will all we will send you the contact info of um, of uh, the fund, so you can be in touch with them uh, later on directly. 
Uh, and this is recorded. So those of you who couldn't make it, who don't know that uh, uh, because they're not here, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a chance to see it recorded or you guys, if you want to check it out again. So what makes you special and what cool stuff have you invented? Really? What makes the fun special is that we've recruited a, you know, a world-class advisory team who between them have hundreds of patents and multiple exits and all of whom have developed technology from start to finish to an exit. Um, and then in terms of ourselves, we've all taken technology from you know, raw IP and made businesses out of it. Um, and we have a great network of people who can coach founders and, uh, and find management teams if necessary. Randall, Mark, and uh, how will you find ideas? Obviously, that's the connection with the university, but we'd love to hear how that would work. Yeah, so we, you know, we collaborate very closely with the commercialization office at Waterloo, and um, we have um, an exclusive arrangement where we get to see all the IP that gets disclosed to them and decide whether we want to invest in it. And then we get a second look at it before it gets licensed to a third party. And then secondly, we collaborate very closely with the university incubators and the, the people who come through those, as well as Communitech and other parts of the ecosystem in Waterloo. And then thirdly, we, you know, we're, tightly connected to all the deans of the different faculties who are aware of the effort and point people in our direction uh, to, uh, to pitch us their ideas or, or even to intercept something to encourage them to, to create a company. And let's talk about the sectors. Which sectors are you looking at? We're looking at clean tech and environmental science. Quantum technologies, there's a little bit of overlap there. Artificial intelligence, computer science, advanced manufacturing, robotics, some life sciences, and optometry. So we're you know, quite broad, but we've recruited a team of, uh, of advisors who can help us out on each individual area. And going back to my last question, can you uh, guys give us uh, uh, one, you know, or two uh, of your best successes personally with your uh, exits and what you guys built. Many people just joined the, the call, uh, okay. so they didn't hear me reading your bio as well. So maybe it's a good time to, uh, yeah. because you have an, such an impressive uh, uh, background. Yeah, oh, Danny, uh, well, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, when you read my bio, it was more focused on the uh, ecosystem work that I've been doing around building investment. But uh, after having done a startup in the States, uh, I have actually had the opportunity to build companies and invest in companies whose value is well over a billion dollars. And uh, um, two thirds of those are exited value as well. So uh, I've really done well and built playbooks to build long-term value in companies and that uh, uh, being able to drive to exits is something I understand. So the company that uh, I was known for in my earlier career was building a public company uh, to, to 50 million US in revenue that uh, sold for 304 million US. Uh, I, we do everything in US dollars, I think on a global fit scale. And just last December, one of my portfolio companies that I've been involved in with Verdexis just exited for uh, well in excess of 250 million US. They don't really disclose it to uh, Rockwell. And it was, it was very much in uh, revolutionizing, including with AI, computerized movements and management. So uh, I have a tremendous amount of experience of taking these companies' early ideas and helping them build up the skill and mass towards exits. Uh, Whereas Mark and Paul have the a much more deep patent and uh, other expertise towards actually doing that in the te deep tech milieu. So that's why we're a good combination. And uh, I know uh, Paul's got some good examples as well. Um, yeah, two, two of my own ideas. Um, you know, as a grad student, we studied gallium nitride semiconductors, which, you know, it's an alternative to silicon and has different properties. Uh, one of which is for power electronics. And uh, 
we took that from the lab um, and we made a prototype on our own with their own resources. And then we got almost immediately acquired by International Rectifier. And then myself and my partner uh, worked at IR to run that effort to you know, build that from a prototype all the way to a commercialized product where we, we did the fab facility design, we did uh, packaging test, long-term reliability, uh, all the way to the point of growing the crystals to, uh, to put in the fab. And, uh, you know, that later caused Infineon to acquire IR. So a double exit on that one. Uh, and I've also developed the foundational technology for, um, you know, um, micro resonator biosensors that's just finding its way into the market today. Mark? Both, both, both of those were from, from Caltech from, you know, that, that took almost 20 years to, from inception to, you know, commercial application and exit. Mark? Yeah, in my case, um, I think one of the most interesting things I've been involved in was the creation of uh, uh, the first digital cellular, cellular system in Europe, which was GSM, upon which everything else, all other cellular was, was developed. So second generation, third generation, and so on. So I had helped Motorola to build a, a huge patent portfolio. Uh, not just my inventions, but um, the inventions of uh, several hundred other uh, researchers that we wrote into the standard and uh, continue this on with, uh, with uh, Research in Motion and, and uh, BlackBerry uh, to, to, to some degree. But um, if, your, uh, if your wireless device is, uh, is made after 1992 or after, then you're using, definitely using my technology. Uh, so I've had a lot of influence in the standards and research and intellectual property uh, areas over the years. And it's, it's been very interesting. Great. So um, thank you. What can, I, I, can I add, you know, Mark, you're continuing on developing technologies for, you know, auto, future automotive radars, for example. Yeah. Yeah. We're looking at uh, quantum technologies, uh, quantum sensors and uh, things of this, this nature. That, that could be used for uh, radars. It could be used for a lot of different things. Um, so uh, what ideas do you like in quantum technology? Uh, say it again. What ideas do you like in quantum technology? Quantum technology? Well, there's, there's quite a bit. Um, I think quantum computing is going to take a little while um, to... Uh, uh, to, to ramp up to a large scale quantum computer, but there's there's a lot of um, a lot of um, interest in uh, like Rydberg Rydberg technology, Rydberg atoms, so vapor cells using Rydberg atoms. I mean, there's uh, quite a bit of work on that. Uh, quantum sensors, um, and a lot of the stuff is still in its infancy. It's not really ready for. Um, I mean, you can't go to the store and buy it, uh, although it does work. Uh, there are proof of concepts and prototypes that do work with some of the new quantum technology, but uh, it's gonna take a little while before that I think the uh, uh, enterprises can, can buy a large scale quantum computer or, or some things of this nature. I think if the size of our fund is gonna preclude us from actually building a quantum computer, but I think there are places yeah. where we can play in terms of you know, software and error correction codes where um, we don't actually have to have a giant capital outlay to build a computer. Now, uh, clean tech, what are you seeing there? For clean tech, you know, I like, um, you know, optical techniques for pollution reduction. I like uh, antimicrobial advanced materials, um, different agricultural technologies that are coming out of Waterloo. Um, Things, things like monitoring um, livestock, for example, to optimize uh, op optimize their growth and environmental impact. So there are a few things that are coming from water. That primarily, I mean, my primary like water technologies, water filtration, water purification. It's a, it's a long list. What um, other amazing companies uh, will you cr be creating? 
I think we've got a few in, um, you know, advanced optical imaging that for clinical diagnostics. I think uh, there's there's one I'm looking at now for um, for automobiles and battery switching technologies. Um, you know, remote DNA sensing uh, and novel materials. So those are a few that uh, that I have my eye on. Um, now, looking at what you will be doing, will you be leading deals or more follow? We intend to lead deals in the early stage. So we're going to intercept technology early. We're going to um, give them money to jumpstart their ideas and then uh, do a pre-seed round, uh, up, probably up to about a million dollars in aggregate. And then as the company matures, we would we would follow people who want to lead, but it, initially we would lead the deal and champion it. Randall, yeah. If I could just, if I could just add to that, Paul, uh, at this stage, for the companies that take even more money, there would be a lot of investors who would like to co-invest around what Cognition is doing because they're providing a leadership not just with money but with understanding and depth in the space, and you know, a global advisory board that can really help. Uh, make these companies sink. So um, it typically early stage involves more syndication than even later stage VC. So the ecosystem is strong for that, but it, it's looking for leadership. It looks for someone to be in the lead and out front and, and leading the deals. And investors in the fund will see our deal flow and they can cherry pick or upsize deals that, that resonate with them if necessary. Um, what would a typical deal look like? So a typical deal would be a professor who invents a technology. Um, he may or may not have some sort of commercial landing zone for it. So he would either approach the commercialization office or he would be working at one of the incubators at Waterloo. Um, where we would identify that technology and then we would work with him to flesh out his business plan, um, find advisors, find coaches to, um, to really find a landing zone for his idea, uh, develop a business plan, make a prototype, and then get that ready for an A-round investment. Now, uh, what do you, why do you think we will be making money here? Uh, historically, uh, Randall has some historical returns he can talk about just from passive portfolios in that ecosystem that are done very well. Right. Yes, um, what's interesting in Canada, one of the questions people ask in Canada is why don't more companies scale up? And that's why I mentioned the co-investment in the ecosystem that we're working around. And that's actually one of the expertise I'm bringing to the table is, is engaging and leveraging the ecosystem. But we've seen at the angel stage around Waterloo region, uh, we've seen significant outperformance in terms of scaling. And I'm talking about the number of companies that are greater than 250 million US in value, either at exit or, or at the last round, uh, being as much as 20 times the Canadian average and many times double or triple the US average. Uh, we are seeing IRRs just on the average investment flow at those deals at 19%, but it's probably closer to 13% with, with the value add of strong leadership. So what we have induced is, or deduced is that introducing a fund with this micro focus on taking this tech out and making it successful with, with our model, we can leverage that existing structure there that's, that's helping the companies and deliver the value add uh, through these very specialized companies and build uh, over the mark of global winners. So, so we see strong evidence that that's the case. And uh, that's, that's why we're very bullish on this. Another aspect that I think that it's a good question. Uh, another aspect that I think is extremely important is that we, we bring uh, uh, an excellent interface between the technology and business and management, which is not typical of, of most startups or most uh, uh, funds. Uh, uh, the three of us uh, are both uh, have expertise in technology, but we also have expertise and experience in business. 
And managing technology is a very different uh, creature, uh, emerging technology as opposed to a mature type of business. We, we have to look out, you know, five, eight years and managing those types of things are, are very different than managing um, something that's uh, either commoditized or near commoditization. Now, how will you be managing risk? That's a good follow on to, to Mark's question. Um, you know, trying to predict the future 10 to 15 years from now is, is extremely difficult. Um, part of our risk management process is to recruit the best experts in the world who, who can guide us in, you know, telling us what we don't know and uh, <laughs> identifying identifying those things early and not not waiting until the last minute to discover that you know, there are things that you don't know that put the project in jeopardy. And definitely in my experience, um, those things come to bite you. Like certainly the, the commercialization details can bite you, the things that you don't know or um, things that met, you know, your misinterpretation of your scientific results can, can bite you. There are a lot of ways to, there are a lot of ways to fail and uh, so we've recruited a great team of multi-sector experts who, who can guide us in that respect. Um, you know, in terms of business risk, there are ourselves who have been there and done that. And our advisors certainly have commercialized technology and exited. So they know all the pitfalls uh, of finding a landing zone for the technology and, and, and getting it acquired. I think I, I recently saw an article where um, product fit was the, the number one reason why startups fail. Um, if you don't have a product fit, then you're certainly at risk. And, uh, you know, we have a network of people who can coach management teams or, and find people to, to complement them to, to make, those things, uh, <clears throat> make those things a reality. Mark, do you have uh, yeah, I think um, yeah, that's a good that's a that's a good uh, uh, response. I, I think in terms of um, uh, managing risk, one one of the things that that that, that I've had good luck with uh, is, of course, the option theoretic approach. Uh, come in small and uh, have the option to say, okay, let's let's pivot. We can change or get rid of a project. Uh, the other thing, and to create some some uh, potential salvage value. If you if you have to do that, if you have to jettison a project, at least you got some some IPR that you can reuse for something else, or uh, or license or sell or what have you. But um, I think in terms of strategy, uh, what's been very effective is forces based strategy. The uh, the, the so called steep forces, the uh, sociological, technological, environmental, economic, political forces seem to drive bit longer term investments uh, past three years because uh, traditional approaches of backward looking analysis, uh, regression analysis, uh, and so on, they're, they're good for about three years. After that, your, your confidence intervals will splay out to the point where you, they're useless. The, the, the information is, when you're, when you're 95% confident the, that the answer is somewhere between infinity and zero, you, you can't do much, right? So there's some investments and some forces that are always there. And there's some investments that are always good. And there's some that are always not good. And, and we, we've learned from these. Yeah, and just to add very briefly, I, I, I would concur with all of this. Active, um, active engagement with the company is going to be critical. Uh, so it's the active engagement that keeps the companies going through the course corrections. And as, as, as Mark said, Paul said, strong portfolio construction where you're, you're, you're doubling down on your winners and you're helping course correct the losers or in some cases salvaging. Uh, to get that portfolio value up is very critical. But, you know, we have uh, developed, and myself in particular, over the last 20 years, playbooks to get these early stage companies through those stage gates uh, faster at lower risk and at greater scale, which is really what we're, uh, we're applying to the cognition fund out of the gate. Now, maybe I'll just jump to a question maybe I should have asked before. What's the fund's lifetime and how much are you seeking to raise? What's the size of the fund eventually? Fund lifetime is going to be 10 years and we're raising up to 100 million. 
Got it. Um, what's special about the advisory team? I think we, we spoke about uh, you guys. Um, anyone else? Oh, they're all subject matter experts. They've all had multiple exits and hundreds of patents. And we have people who, who know how to develop a company for an exit. And, and we have specialists, in particular, Mark Schwartz in Chicago, who, um, who has a company devoted exclusively to product development and taking a product from an idea all the way to manufacturability. And he's done hundreds of products and won multiple awards. So. And maybe my, my last question before we'll go to uh, questions from our um, audience here is what kind of exits should we anticipate? So I'm anticipating, uh, you know, two pots of exits, one where we develop a company and it becomes acquired within, you know, three to five years and that capital is returned. So I'm hoping to get return of capital early on and then home run companies that we incubate for multiple years and either become IPOs or large acquisition targets. Great. Thank you. So, um, Let's go to see some questions from uh, our audience here. Uh, so the first one is, uh, how is your collaboration with the UK? Do you have anything there? Someone is asking. I'm not sure um, as you mostly work with uh, Waterloo based companies. We, we do have a, a UK investor. Oh, okay. And they, um, I think they primarily invest in us for our pipeline because they invest later on in the, uh, in the life cycle of the company. Um, so, clean tech was mentioned. Uh, does that stretch into improving the greening of mineral uh, processing? Looking at many of the EV projects and uh, inputs of uh, cobalt, nickel, and rare earth elements being uh, currently not green technology, would green my mineral processing, uh, especially with the increased demand to uh, electrification and um, decarbonization, be a near-term target, or is that to close uh, um, um, uh, to mining for your investors? That's definitely on our radar and definitely something we would consider um, if we found technologies to do that. Um, Certainly mining pollution is one, or certain mining and recycling pollution are some of the, uh, the biggest culprits for environmental damage that are out there. And, uh, it's definitely on my radar. Yeah. And, and I, would just add, I would just add to that, that Waterloo has a tremendous depth in nanotechnologies, uh, which is likely where that would come from, although it could come from other areas. So that's particular expertise of the university's underlying research and uh, development of IP. I have one idea that I've, that I've seen for the production of lithium, um, but we haven't fleshed it out yet. Uh, yeah, we've been also looking... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, sorry. no we've been also... I was just going to say, we, we, we've been also looking at a, um, um, at a technology that will increase the bulk conductivity of copper by quite a bit. And uh, this could be useful in... Um, lightening uh, electric motors, making things more powerful, lighter, and with a lot less uh, heat dissipation and power dissipation. Um, what do you look for in a founding team? And what skills do founders need today to succeed as leaders? I'll let Randall take that one. He's got, a, he's got his playbook that, and yeah. he's quite experienced in that. Yeah, well, normally have a playbook where uh, we look for uh, founders who are very coachable. In other words, they have the emotional intelligence to learn and grow and to uh, work with the external people that are actually going to help them uh, scale faster, better and more quickly. So that, that's the normal playbook we, we put in place. I, I would say that in Cognition Fund, we're all going to run into one extra thing, which is uh, making sure that the professors... Uh, or the postdocs who are primarily researchers who come out are in the right role. So it may well be that many times, and it's been found that professors running companies isn't always the right answer. Uh, sorry if there's any professors on the line. There's lots of stories about that, and I've had some uh, 
uh, experiences with that in my early career. But having said that, uh, we will actively use our networks to recruit the management around what might be a, a technical team coming in as a technical founder. So just because of the nature, we expect to see that a little more than in perhaps other startup type companies. I, I'd like to add that, um, you know, part of that equation is finding founders whose ideas are going to work. Um, and whether they have the creativity to uh, to pivot or solve the problems that uh, that will inevitably arise, um, I know in my own experience there there are always problems that come up, and you have to be very creative to overcome them. And of course, the the, the other the other aspect is we, we do look for founders who who have got that enthusiasm. You know, they want to do something, want to make something work, and they've got their own ideas, and that's extremely important. Uh, another is mentioning, um, I've connected with you all, amazing souls on LinkedIn. I hope to hear back from you soon. I appreciate your time and knowledge. Great webinar. Thank you. Uh, could you elaborate on the exclusive IP relationship? UW has creator-owned IP policy, including creator-owned copyright. That's right. And But not all that creator-owned copyright uh, is retained by the creator if it goes to the commercialization office. And our agreement is with the commercialization office where we get a uh, first right of review for things that are disclosed and funded by that office. So, uh, you know, if you've funded your own IP, and then it belongs to you. But if you require help and need the university to step in, then there are other, there's a, an agreement that you have to sign with them. And uh, at that point, we get a right of first review. Could the panelists perhaps suggest which vehicles or companies are available to invest in these ideas, such as quantum computing, uh, filtration, and many other that were mentioned? I think that's the fund. That's the idea. Here. Yeah, that's that's Cognition Fund. Uh, you know, we're, we're ready, to, ready to take an investment. Um, what is the maximum exit time you're looking for health tech and clean tech? We're hoping to have exits in 10 years, maximum. How did you negotiate an exclusive relationship with Waterloo? We, we want to know how you guys did that, it seems. Um, we've, we've all been involved with Waterloo for a very long time. Uh, I'm an alum, Randall's an alum and uh, we've had a good relationship with the university. Randall, do you have any comment? Uh, you're on, I, you're on mute. I, I was muted, I apologize for that. That's the theme of COVID, isn't it? Um, as, so yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question because I think there, there was a, a synergy of, of need and uh, opportunity here because as Paul said, the days of licensing and uh, are, you know, kind of coming to the end with patents losing some of their value. So really, there's a need for greater and new models for commercialization. So it was a really a win-win opportunity. Uh, the structure includes that the University of Waterloo has a minority in the general partner of the fund. So it's got, it's got a cross motivation and we have very direct ties in working with the university being independent, but still working with them in a collaborative way. So it is, it is a real win-win, but as Paul said, it comes because there were strong relationships that made it possible. Steve from Montreal is asking, what's the minimum investment? Is there a current fundraising in progress? That's actually the, the reason we're here. So there is, uh, but what's the minimum investment? Half a million dollars. Thank you. Um, how many companies will you be investing in? How many do you think will fall? How many will be superb investments? Any chance of for unicorns? How, what's your feeling? There? Sure, uh, you know, Waterloo Engineering is number one for billion dollar company creation. So there will definitely be unicorns. I won't, can't, can't say definitely, but in all likelihood, there will be unicorns that come out of this. Um, you know, the, thing, the models we've made have an attrition rate, you know, as much as 70% will fail, but we can still achieve 30% IRRs. Um, I'm hoping at the end, we'll have at least 30 portfolio companies that will go on and, and get a round investment. 
And uh, last question here is what areas are you interested in in the healthcare space? So uh, drug delivery, I've seen a few, um, a few companies that have a particular form of um, antivirals and drug delivery technologies, not just for people, but for plants and animals. Uh, we've seen other um, plant-derived compounds for uh, reducing cholesterol and blood pressure. Um, monitoring technologies for, for health monitoring and tracking. Um, those are those are a few that that are current. Uh, we've seen a couple in optometry, if if that helps. So measuring your eye health and uh, and drug drug delivery to the eye. So that'll give you a flavor of the kinds of things that we see today. Now, what we're going to see in two or three years, um, that remains to that remains to be seen. Uh, Jean-Francois says it's very interesting seminar. Thank you. Um, I think that's about uh, all the question we, uh, questions we've had so far. Uh, very interesting, uh, a new uh, venture coming from the University of Waterloo uh, and uh, a fund that's being uh, head, uh, headed by uh, a very successful entrepreneurs with a very strong track record um, that, uh, that they believe would uh, be the best team to actually uh, monetize correctly on the uh, great innovation coming from the university. Um, uh, someone is asking where would be best to present a potential deck to you if, if uh, I, I believe the fund is working uh, uh, with the Waterloo uh, uh, companies only, but again, any questions you guys may have, um, you can ask um, um, the fund directly. Um, as a as a comment, we're, we're working in that ecosystem, and if people have ideas to combine useful IP, we would entertain those to, to work outside, to have an access outside of where. Great. Anything else uh, that you would like to add at this point? I will, of course, again, remind you that uh, we will send you uh, by tomorrow uh, the contact information and uh, the recorded session for all of you and those who couldn't make it to view later on. Anything else, uh, Paul, uh, Randall, and uh, Mark, you'd like to add? Well, I would just say thank you, Denny, for uh, hosting this event. Uh, we're, we're very excited about this opportunity, which is really focused on not building sort of the technologies of the past, but you know, building the technologies into global companies that are really going to build the future. Uh, of, of where the world is going. And we feel coming out of COVID is a real inflection point for starting the next generation. So we think our timing is spot on. Um, great, anything else, Paul, Mark, that you'd like uh, to add? Yeah, we're, you know, we're gonna be taking uh, you know, lots of technical risk for lots of, lots of reward. You know. We're going to try and predict the future and invest in it. Um, so uh, great. I mean, we're as 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 uh, uh, some of you that knows that know us know, Canada is one of our major markets, uh, and uh, we will be having our uh, in-person conferences in Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto probably uh, early next year. Um, we're working on that, and we will be having a Canadian family office conference right after. Um, the summer with Faskin, Scotia, and other great uh, partners. Uh, and I'll just uh, mention, uh, basically the fund is open to everybody, not just Canadian investors, US investors, European investors can all join. Anybody can join. Sounds great. So I, I would like to uh, wish you all to get out of the lockdown um, very fast and, um, and uh, meet with us in person uh, at our events. And uh, I would like to thank you all for it was a pleasure uh, having you here with us. And um, hopefully we'll see you soon uh, at future webinars and in person. Okay. Thank you. Danny. Thanks a lot for having us. Uh, thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, take care. Bye. -bye. Bye.